I'm Adam Friedel. I'm the Program Manager at ProBonerNet. I want to thank everybody for joining us today to talk about innovations in technology-enabled pro bono. Uh, this is a prelude to uh, pro bono week, National Pro Bono Week, later in October. So we're hoping to get everybody uh, really excited about uh, some of the new things that are going on in this area. And we have a really fantastic panel to talk to us today people from across the country who are going to be talking about remote services, about interactive uh, pro bono work, about uh, ticketing systems for efficient use of volunteers, and, and a lot of other things. So uh, I don't want to hold them up. I want to get started uh, and get all that great content to you. Uh, here are our presenters, uh, Paul Hadel from New Mexico Legal Aid, Rick Morgan and Beth Anderson from Colorado. Tony Liu from Pro Bono Net, uh, the Immigration Advocates Network, Brian Houghton from Law Help Ontario, and Claudia Johnson from Pro Bono Net as well. Uh, these are the things I just mentioned that we're going to go over. We're going to try to spend about an hour on the content, and then uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. We'd really like to hear what you think. Uh, if you have questions you know, in between presenters or burning desire to say something, then feel free to jump in. Uh, we don't want to be overly formal, but uh, generally we'll try to save most questions for the end. Uh, these are the takeaways that we want folks to uh, be aware of uh, after today's program. Um, you know, it's a lot of really important uh, um, sort of, well, innovative uh, breakthroughs in, in the way that uh, legal services are, are delivered, uh, and especially by pro bono volunteers um, who, you know, traditionally have not uh, always been on the forefront of uh, doing things in a, in a new and different way. So to get started now, I'm going to turn it over to Paul Hadel, who's the director of the Volunteer Attorney Program at New Mexico Legal Aid, and he's going to talk to us about virtual legal fairs. Paul? Yeah, thank you, Adam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this, this call, and I am the director of the Volunteer Attorney Program with New Mexico Legal Aid, and the program is a collaboration between Legal Aid and the State Bar of New Mexico. I'm relatively new in my position. I've been here for about six months now and came via Chicago, and it's been exciting for me to see the difference in a, a large urban area like Chicago versus New Mexico, where one of the things that we come up against regularly is trying to connect clients in very rural areas with attorneys in the more urban areas. New Mexico, for those of you that don't know, is a very large state geographically. It's the fifth largest in the nation. Uh, we've got a, a big issue with poverty in New Mexico. We're the second poorest state in the entire country. And like a lot of places, we have a lot of attorneys in one or two primary areas. Uh, the map on the screen kind of shows Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and there's a corridor there along the Rio Grande River where the, almost 90% of the attorneys in New Mexico practice and live in one of those two cities. That leaves a huge geographic area spreading over the rest of the state that we are trying to connect attorneys with. We've done legal fairs where we've gone out in the community and tried to recruit attorneys from the local communities and had some success with that. But one of the new things that we're trying to do more of is what we call virtual legal fairs and over the last couple of years, we've hosted a couple of virtual legal fairs that have connected attorneys in the Albuquerque area with clients in the rural areas. Um, one of the things that we found is most important in hosting these virtual legal fairs is identifying which communities really need this service the most. New Mexico Legal Aid has 10 offices spread across the entire state and is the statewide legal services provider. Um, but those 10 offices uh, aren't able to really get all the coverage that we're able to need across the state. And so um, we've identified some of the areas that are the most remote uh, areas that have really challenging circumstances with poverty. And then we've identified stakeholders in the community that are already working with people there. So 
for instance, uh, community centers, local health organizations, um, our local um, Head Start programs, community colleges. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. So it, it's been really important for us to identify who are the people that are already in the community that may be providing services, although not legal services, and how can we connect with them. So this past year we worked in two very tiny communities, one called Cuesta and one called Tucumcari. In Tucumcari we were able to connect with a, uh, a branch of a uh, community college there and use some of their facilities that had a, a small computer lab. In Cuesta, we were able to connect with the local public library and also use a couple of the computers that they had uh, and um, connect in with attorneys in Albuquerque. It was really important for us in advertising and recruiting in those areas, as you might imagine, um, recruiting uh, local volunteers to help with screening of clients. Um, and then what we did through our program at New Mexico Legal Aid was to recruit attorneys in Albuquerque based on a variety of legal areas that those attorneys practice in. The people on the ground in Quest and Tucumcari then screened the client for what their legal issue was and we connected using Skype in this particular clinic with attorneys uh, sitting in the Albuquerque office. One of the most important things that we discovered was having a dry run was critical. I went out to the two locations prior to the event to make sure that the technology was working and one of the things I discovered in small little Cuesta was we had a, uh, a major thunderstorm pass through the area that knocked out all the communications and that, that obviously was a, a big issue for the day of the event. We didn't want something like that to happen. Uh, the, what I, I learned from that was then on the day of the event, I was able to bring a, a mobile hotspot, a MiFi hotspot um, that connected um, my computer. I had a tablet running Skype um, connected to the, the wireless from the MiFi, and then we um, coordinated with the technology folks at the courthouse in Albuquerque then. So that wireless availability was a big issue because um, it was spotty in that little tiny community um, in the library there and the internet uh, connectivity was, was an issue. Another thing that we came across was privacy concerns in, in a small little place like a, a, a public library, which the one in, in Cuesta is literally a converted trailer home, is, um, serves as the public library. It's very small. We wanted to make sure that the people who were on Skype and communicating with the attorneys had, a, had the uh, space around them to themselves so that uh, there were no privacy concerns. Um, and so we tried to keep all the, the clients who were waiting um, and being screened, doing that in a separate location from where the, the folks who were actually communicating with the attorneys were. Um, for us, the appropriate technology in this case was, was Skype. We found it the easiest to use and, and load onto our computers there. Um, it, it worked pretty well for us. In the past, we had had some phone clinics, but we obviously um, appreciate the ability to see the attorneys and for the attorneys to see the clients. And then we also used uh, email and scanning uh, functions there at the library in order to uh, scan any documents into the attorney sitting on the other end. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to point out, which is obviously um, clients and attorneys have varying degrees of familiarity and, and comfort with using Skype. Um, in our case, in, in Cuesta and in Tucumcari, we actually found that a lot of the clients were very comfortable with using uh, Skype technology, but some of our attorneys were a little bit more reticent. Um, they were maybe a, a little bit more used to face-to-face uh, -face contact, and this was um, a bit of a, a challenge for them. It was very important then for us at Legal Aid um, to be in the area and able to help with any, uh, any concerns that came up or any issues with using that, that technology. That's basically all I had on that. Um, in our event, the, the event just this, this past month, we were able to serve about 30 people um, in those two communities, which I know is really is important to provide access to the justice system in two communities that are incredibly difficult to reach just based on their geography. Um, there was a couple issues going on in the two communities. 
uh, legal issues that we were able to identify that were uh, community-wide, and I think that the attorneys in Albuquerque then are going to be able to provide representation. That's all I had, Adam. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. That was really fantastic. Um, I know that I have uh, several questions already. I'm going to write them down and save them for the end. Um, but uh, I think we'll hear uh, some of the same themes uh, from our next presenters, who are Rick Morgan and Beth Anderson. They have uh, been doing virtual pro se clinics uh, in the state of Colorado for some time now. Uh, I'm really excited to have them. I first reached out to Beth, uh, and she graciously agreed to present for us, and Beth said, you know who you really need on this is Rick Morgan. He's the guru of virtual uh, pro bono clinics. So, so excited to hear them both. And Rick and Beth, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you very much, Adam. Rick Morgan here. Um, and uh, I'm the coordinator for the VPC program. And, and thanks for your kind words. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I deserve those, but I'm very pleased today to be joined uh, by Beth Anderson, who will speak on innovations on unbundled services here in Colorado. And Beth is also, in addition to being a premier individual on unbundled services, is also one of our very dedicated volunteers supporting the Virtual Pro Se Clinic. Uh, the Virtual Pro Se Clinic, or VPC, as we refer to it, is a is a public-private collaboration to deliver free monthly legal clinics to public libraries across Colorado by a computer link, and we use the Zoom televideo conferencing software to do that. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, the uh, Virtual Pro Se Clinic concept um, gave, it came up because uh, the numbers from Colorado last year show that in 2013 there were over 675,000 new uh, court cases, and of those court cases, more than a half million Colorado citizens appeared in court without a lawyer. Um, you know, we don't have the population of some of the other folks who are online, but that's one out of every 10 Coloradoans across Colorado uh, uh, who appeared without a lawyer last year. Uh, on the next slide, um, beginning in 2013 with the proof of concept, we served 80 patrons in three uh, t test bed clinics in 2013. And then beginning in 2014 with the implementation of phase two, we've served uh, just over 400 patrons across Colorado so far with nine monthly clinics. Uh, and those clinics are all free, uh, first come, first served uh, clinics. Uh, and we currently have six dedicated volunteer attorneys, including Beth Anderson, who are supporting those nine uh, clinics statewide. Well, the reality is that's a tiny, tiny fraction of those half million pro se litigants in Colorado, but it's a place to start. Uh, and we've done that by uh, building partnerships uh, in each one of those uh, different communities with local libraries, local bar associations, the local bench, uh, legal aid providers, veterans groups, and local elected officials uh, as we go along. And then as you can see on the next slide, uh, the goals that we have are to use existing public infrastructure, the computers and the, SAR, the uh, broadband access uh, that's resident in local libraries, uh, and to try to do that by securing a broader public engagement uh, in that process. And, and in doing that, we've gotten great support from the bench and from local bar associations and local ATJ structures, which tend to vary from county to county, but universally we're getting really great support. Uh, on the next slide, I have kind of an idea of what the phase, the 2013 phase one proof of concept involved three test bed counties, which are very broadly spread across Colorado. Uh, those were very well received. Uh, th those were set up and installed at no cost to the hosting libraries. As I said before, they're all free, all first come, first serve, uh, and it worked very well. Uh, and we we were able to do that to, uh, so that so well that uh, uh, by 2014 we elected to go ahead and move on. Uh, on the next slide, you can see the proof of concept was intended to go ahead and build partnerships and to establish the, the practicality of doing that using the Zoom software interface. Uh, that one-on-one -on -one attorney dialogue, typically for about 20 minutes apiece, uh, provided uh, instant access to state judicial forms as a, as a website has been set up here in Colorado for some time for that purpose, plus supplemental materials. And with, the, uh, with that software, we can do what's called uh, internet-guided touring, 
uh, to take uh, library patrons to specific places on the internet and uh, show them where the resources are available and work with them with those resources to help them uh, uh, in their case. And all their, these uh, clinics, by the way, cover all civil matters here in Colorado. Uh, the test bed process uh, taught us that there is a lot to learn about what this capability has to offer. Uh, so we're, we're only at the very beginning of this process. And then on the next slide, you can see as uh, in January 2014, we stood up uh, phase two, the preliminary fielding of this capability by adding an additional six counties across the state. Um, and um, we're supporting those now. Uh, even so, uh, having uh, gone from three counties to nine counties, the demand has completely outstripped our ability to support. We have another nine counties that have contacted us and asked to be added to the wait list. Uh, so we're, we're going to continue to deal with that as we go along. On the next slide, you see just a sample flyer. Uh, this one happens to be from the Durango area. Uh, those flyers are put together for each one of the clinics, the county clinics, and then disseminated to those local communities. Uh, some particular communities prefer to have different structures for their clinics, and of course we accommodate those in every way that we can because we're, we're committed to making sure that the, the clinics that we deliver by computer link are, are the clinics that the communities themselves envision and not something that we come in from the outside to tell them what they should have. Um, on the next slide uh, is just an example of the monthly press announcements that we do for each one of these clinics to local news outlets. And by and large, this uh, goes out uh, in each community to about 50 to 60 different email recipients to, uh, to provide for pretty broad coverage in the communities uh, as we go along. And I have an example to show what, those, what that uh, email distribution list is composed of. Uh, this happens to be from an area in northeastern Colorado, Logan County, and it gives you an idea on the next slide here what newspapers and radio stations and uh, elected officials, officials uh, veterans organizations, churches, uh, legal advocates uh, right across the board. We think we get pretty good market penetration with this email, monthly email distribution announcing those monthly clinics. And then on the next slide uh, is a sense of what we're looking for in our phase three build out here in Colorado is, is aimed at uh, building a clinic structure to support all 64 Colorado counties, relying on a concentration of volunteer attorneys. Like Paul was saying, our uh, volunteer attorneys are concentrated in the major urban areas like Denver, Colorado Springs, and so forth. Uh, and we're looking to tap into that resource in those mostly urban areas to support this in both urban and rural environments across Colorado. And uh, we'll need, eventually on the next slide, you can see that there's a requirement for 250 volunteer attorneys uh, in order to support that 64 county structure. That would provide uh, each volunteer attorney would do one three-hour clinic every four months, so a total of nine hours of pro bono time per volunteer attorney per year. Uh, and that seems like a tolerable load for our volunteer attorneys as we uh, work our way towards build out. Uh, based on our current growth, rate of growth, uh, it hasn't been very long, but if we continue with the current rate of growth, we'll have that 64 county structure by 2020. So, and finally, in summary on the, on the last slide, uh, is, this is the virtual pro se clinic is one element and not is, is not the answer to all solutions, but it, it should be one element of a broad spectrum of support uh, designed to deliver services to low-income and indigent litigants uh, and depends in, in its fielding and in its operation in a close collaboration with many, many other ATJ efforts. So with that, I'll turn it over to Beth. Uh, thank you so very much. Hi, this is Beth Anderson. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you great. Okay, super. Um, just to give some perspective, I'm sitting outside in the mountains of Colorado. Um, I'm part of a conference for the Chamber of Commerce, and then I could just step out and participate in this. And a little more perspective, of course, I logged in well ahead, and my computer bounced, and then my phone broke. And those are the kind of hurdles that you have to overcome to make these projects work. Um, in the county courts for Jefferson County, Colorado, um, clients were getting bounced off after 20 minutes of contact time. And so we moved our projects to local libraries. And so um, I'm just kind of the um, trial attorney, the pragmatist out of this. And, and I think that we have so many options now with technology that we're just going to have to keep persevering beyond 
one step back or two. It's just a technology that's time has come. And I think that Adam is able to pull up a website that I gave him the link to. Yeah, um, just one second. And while he's doing that, I'll talk about the practical experience that I had the first time I did my online clinic. Um, I do a lot of phone consulting, as attorneys do, but my first online clinic at the courts of um, Colorado, the client was able to um, see me on screen through a program called Zoom, and I saw her. Well, I saw she had an adult son sitting by. I saw her go into tears at one point during our consult um, just because of the overwhelming family law issue she was discussing. And then I saw her smiling at the end, and that's the kind of thing that all those visual cues I would not have picked up over the telephone. So that's one of the advantages that um, the Skyping or Zoom or any of those technologies are going to bring um, that you wouldn't have with pure phone contact. Um, and the web page that you're looking at now is the Jefferson County web page. And we have forms. And if Adam wants to negotiate through it, he can, like a client. Um, and I can kind of walk you through what we do. So click on Divorce, Family Matters, Civil Unions. How about click on that one? You got it. And this is how I talk to my clients. And we can screen share. And then I'll say, oh, um, let's say you are getting a divorce. Can you scroll down to divorce and let's find divorce or legal separation and click on that. Um, no children or children, it doesn't matter to me. And um, these are all forms that are provided by the county of Colorado, well, what we've clicked on here, it's going to show you how to calculate your child support as you scroll through. So let's click on a form like a JDF, um, any of these JDF forms where it says, if you're okay with downloading, download PDF. Yeah, anyone, like how about general steps, download PDF, JDF 1098. That will pull up a form, and Colorado has, caught, has provided forms that each client can pull up and it will walk them through how to, for example, calculate child support. And even um, if you clicked on another form, it would actually, the client can fill it out, email it to me, and um, uh, file it with the court by mail, or I can email it. So I'm just basically walking him through as a guinea pig the kind of um, conversation and screen sharing, and I love this. This is the petition for a dissolution of marriage or divorce, and it's got click boxes. And in Colorado, the client can cl click all these, and I can help them because some portions are very strategic, and there's more to them than what you would think. For example, if you don't click that box that says maintenance, later that's maybe going to affect your ability to seek that type of benefit, which is alimony. So. Um, being able to do a screen share and say, um, well, let's click um, each box, and here's where you fill it in is um, just one of the many ways that online representation is helpful. Um, and then for me, I also wanted to share that it goes hand in love with unbundled legal representation. Um, and what that is for attorneys who are not or any listeners who are not familiar, um, you can do pay-as-you-go legal representation. I believe Colorado is unique or at least a minority state that I can literally enter for a hearing and file a notice of, en of limited entry of appearance with the court, argue a hearing, and then at the end of the hearing hand the judge a paper that says notice of completion. And that's a notice, not a motion, which means the judge has no ability to tell me you're still on this case, ma'am. Um, I'm done. And that is wonderful for clients who can't afford to have that ongoing relationship. And as an attorney, I love it because many clients, I don't want that ongoing relationship. That is not a client where I want a retainer and all the ins and outs, especially modest income clients who maybe can't pay. So I have my traditional full service clients, but I also have these unbundled clients where I'm not comfortable for payment reasons. Um, or for even just their personalities, maybe not a good mesh with mine, or, or for so many reasons, I just enter, I do a hearing, I draft a pleading, and then I say, notice of completion, I'm done. And um, that allows me to serve a lot of modest income clients. I would say in my private practice, I probably serve more modest income 
clients than a lot of those agencies that are funded by um, private grants or the government um, to do that work. Um, they just can't reach a high number of clientele. And so um, I'm able to, with phone calls, so to do a lot of that, and it supplements my private practice. So I just wanted to touch on that as well. So between the online connections, the sharing of forms, texting, emailing, um, I can practice from anywhere, whether it's in the mountains of Colorado, in a courthouse, or in my office. Um, and I really enjoy the sessions I do with Rick. He's really taking that statewide. I became involved in that through um, access to justice, and we wanted to bring the attorneys to the clients. Well, now we can. And without disrupting my workday, I can pop in, meet with clients virtually, and then pop out. So that's just some pragmatic information based on one practitioner. Um, and I can see this going very far. Um, I'm doing virtual clinics now where a number of people can um, join in just like the panel here. So thanks for your time and um, for the ability to participate. Thank you, Beth. It's really uh, fantastic to hear from the perspective of a, a volunteer and somebody so involved as yourself. Uh, what it's like to be a part of one of these programs. We've got some really fantastic questions and comments, um, but in the interest of making sure that everybody has an opportunity to present their great work, I'm going to hold them until the end. And next I'm going to ask uh, my colleague and good friend Tony Liu from the Immigration Advocates Network to tell us about Citizenship Works 2.0. Thanks, Adam. Um, as Adam mentioned, I'm from the Immigration Advocates Network, which is um, uh, a project of Pro Bono Nets, uh, along with other national immigration uh, network organizations. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, a project that is not live yet. Um, we're actually still developing it. It's called Citizenship Works. It's actually the next generation of Citizenship Works. Um, but we have been using our current generation of Citizenship Works um, and getting pro bono attorneys to get involved through this technology platform. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we use it today and then also what, how, what we've learned about the challenges we faced in getting pro bono attorneys involved and how that's informed how we're developing the next generation system. So um, on this slide, you'll see two different workshops that we've conducted using our, our um, platform. And what Citizenship Works is, is it's a site that uses uh, uh, La Hope Interactive, which is a, a document assembly platform, to present a user-friendly interview that will screen somebody to make sure that uh, they are eligible to, be, to apply for U.S. citizenship. There's also a second component which allows applicants to go through and then complete uh, an interview to populate their form application to become a citizen. And the current model relies on people to actually go to a workshop and, uh, and get help from attorneys um, and volunteers to complete the form and have that form reviewed. Um, and so the, the innovation for us was that by setting up these self-guided interviews, it kind of takes the data entry component of completing those forms and filling out intake um, interviews our intake questionnaires um, out of the hands of attorneys and as it puts it in the hands of the actual applicants themselves. And so what we found is that allows an, one, uh, one advocate to be able to assist multiple people at a time. Um, but one of the problems that we've faced in terms of getting pro bono attorneys is that uh, it's, a hard, it's hard to get immigration attorneys in, in any kind of volume to volunteer for these types of workshops. Um, there are various reasons for that. Um, you know, one of the main ones being that you know, uh, naturalization applications is actually something that a lot of uh, immigration attorneys do charge for, and so it's it's a it's a hard kind of decision to make to 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 volunteer for a workshop when you might otherwise charge for that service, um, that exact same service. Um, but the the problem with recruiting non-immigration attorneys is that they have a limited ability to assist those applicants because naturalization um, being the final step in an immigrant's journey to becoming a U.S. citizen is actually one that is kind of the most rigorous in terms of uh, the level of attention to 
to the person's past that the Department of Homeland Security will pay. Um, so they'll look very closely at all the details of the person's past. So th that step is actually, it requires somebody with a lot of knowledge of immigration and uh, naturalization law to make sure that that person is not going to maybe get denied for some small mistake on the form or in a, in a worst case scenario actually get uh, put into deportation proceedings. So we were kind of struggling with that, um, that question in trying to figure out programs that would allow us to uh, capitalize on people who are actually in, you know, in our informal polling of, of non-immigration attorneys. Many expressed interest in wanting to help in this area but um, felt that they, they didn't have the expertise. If you could go to the next slide. So in addressing that, we started to design Citizenship Works too. And um, this is a, a, a portion of our, of our new homepage that kind of explains how the application works. Um, the new platform will allow people to, uh, to pre-screen themselves initially, create an account, and actually guide themselves through the same kind of interactive interview that we currently have, um, although it's it's been updated and has a, a a newly designed interface. But the the thing that we wanted to do was to integrate an ability to create um, uh, to link virtually with an attorney. So you'll see that the second step you can um, either get online help or meet somebody in person, and then and then um, and then the third step. Um, this is an assisted pro se model, and so the idea is that the attorney's intervention is in that middle step of just of helping somebody review their application. Okay. One of the key components of this is making sure that the expert system or the guided interview that we create has really kind of thought through all of the rules that, um, that will need to be applied in, in terms of logic. And that's something that um, we pay a lot of attention to for the pro se applicants. But in our um, in the future, we're hoping to actually maybe either use the exact same expert system or create one that is custom built for pro bono attorneys to give them the structured guidance in terms of how to review an application. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of contextual information throughout the site that helps the pro se applicants understand why we're asking a particular question. Um, and by the same token, we'll be able to use that contextual information tool to provide information to an attorney about specific questions, um, it, not just limited to why is it an important question to ask, but maybe including follow-up questions that they may want to ask if the answer is a particular answer, or maybe even pointing to uh, to other references that they can uh, they can look up um, so that it, they can have more context for for the advice they'll they'll be giving. The other piece that we're hoping to implement is the ability to create uh, specific accounts for pro bono attorneys. Currently, we're designing the system to allow the applicants to create an account and then for the advocates or the attorneys to create an account. And they both have different views of the same uh, data. So from the attorney's view, they'll be able to see a snapshot of the person's kind of basic information. Um, and then, in addition to that, review the application itself, but also see all of the issues that have been uh, flagged as red flags by our expert system, and uh, and actually add case notes and also resolve some of those red flags. The benefit of building our own custom site is that we can actually then create an, an, a new account type for pro bono attorneys that limits their access to uh, only clients that have been assigned to them. So. That way, you're not worrying about you know conflicts issues because uh, the attorney can has have sort of free reign on and look at all of the clients that are uh, associated with this organization, but rather they're just limited to seeing the the few clients that they've volunteered to uh, to help serve. But the most exciting piece for us is uh, integrating um, video conf or video chat, and so um, we've already heard from other presenters who've who've already been using this to great with, with great success and I think for us what we wanted to do was take it a step further and, and one of the challenges you've heard mentioned was that sometimes the attorneys themselves are not uh, tech savvy and the clients are will have issues using things like third-party software um, like Skype or um, or or other things where you have to maybe download and install things configure them and so what we wanted to do was build it right into the website um, so we're using a uh, 
a service called Talkbox, which is actually the, the same technology behind Google Hangouts, um, which means that it's completely web-based. There's, no, uh, there's no plugins to install. There's no software to install. It runs completely natively in the browser, um, currently only in Chrome and Firefox, but I think uh, the standards are going to be set soon so that Internet Explorer will also be, um, be able to run this natively w within the browser. And so that, that brings huge benefits for us in terms of uh, supporting our users, um, both the attorneys and the applicants. Um, and then also what we implemented was this uh, live text chat. So you see in the bottom right of that screen, there's uh, almost like an instant messenger client that allows you to chat directly with your assigned attorney. So we're really excited about this, um, really excited to roll it out. And, uh, and I, I personally am, uh, was very delighted to hear that other people have already been doing this um, using existing technologies um, because there's a, a lot of experience there that we're hoping to uh, draw from in terms of some of those challenges um, that were already described today. Um, I just see that there's a quick question that I can answer very um, easily. There's a question about which expert system we're using. It's actually being, it's a custom built rules engine that we're uh, working with developers on. So um, we're not using, um, we're not using uh, hot docs or Neurologics or any of the other kind of uh, uh, logic engines that um, exist. So we have considered uh, in integrating that if we were to uh, create other versions of, of this platform for other types of benefits. Um, the level of, F of effort uh, involved in creating an expert system from scratch is uh, something that we felt we needed to kind of understand and um, and we've learned a lot from that process, and we're hoping to uh, to either continue to use the system we developed or think about how we can leverage things that already exist out there. And I think that's it from me. Great, thank you. That that was really fantastic. Um, it's really uh, you know people around here, I know in our office, are really really excited about this. Uh, Citizenship Works has been a really popular project across the country, uh, and this is just going to take it to the next level. So thank you for that, Tony. And uh, next, we're going to turn uh, north to Ontario. Uh, Brian Houghton joins us from Law Help Ontario. And he is going to talk about uh, something I'm really uh, excited to hear about, a, a ticketing system for pro bono volunteers. And he may prove me totally wrong, but my basic understanding is that it's sort of like it when you uh, talk to your tech support folks and they say, oh, there's an issue, I'm going to create a ticket for it uh, as a way to keep things organized and, and moving along. And um, so I'm excited to hear how it applies in this context. Brian, thanks for joining us. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background on Law Help Ontario. Uh, we started in 2007 and we handle civil non-family cases. We have three self-help centers in Ontario, and we originally started them as uh, drop-in, in-person assistance. Uh, but as you may know, Ontario is very large. It's, uh, I've heard, as, uh, as large as Texas and Montana combined. So we have a lot of remote communities that need help, and it's simply just too expensive to operate help centers everywhere. So that led us to opening our remote assistance project. Uh, we, we found it quickly after starting this that it was difficult to manage all the inquiries that were coming in. Uh, we wanted our staff to be able to help with remote calls, so in a way that the volume is sort of spread over the three offices rather just in one location. Um, we really started with one office sort of dealing with them, and when the volume got too large, we wanted to incorporate our other, our other help centers in, uh, with, the, with the volume that was coming in. So that's how we decided to start the ticket system. Um, as I said, it really allows the staff and volunteers at any of our centers to help clients by using the tools. And they log inquiries, and anyone, any, any of our locations can jump in to help, as well as our volunteer lawyers as well. Um, so you know, it allows us to forward tickets and have volunteers answer or call clients whenever they might be. Um, but as Adam mentioned, it's really a way of keeping everything organized and really tracking all of the things that go on with inquiries that are coming into the center. So it has a lot of capabilities. I'll just go over a few things. If you want to go to um, 
the first slide, which is the creating a ticket for the registered user, or the unregistered user rather. So this is one way tickets can be opened in our office. Uh, we can open them on a portal on our website. Um, we've customized it so that we gather and require you know, an email uh, address to open the ticket, some basic information. And instead of trying to write it down somewhere, um, the law student would simply um, call the client, open a ticket, and, and basically write the message that they had. So we'll go to the next screen. And before it actually goes into the ticket part that they open, they'll select the department. So we can sort of channel inquiries to different people or departments within the organization. On the next screen, this is where the law student would type the assistance that is required or what the client called about. Uh, we can add a file here if we wanted to. So the call is essentially added to a queue. On the next slide, uh, the screen that comes up is a list of all of the open tickets. Now, for the purpose of this example, I just uh, cut out all of the other tickets that were open in our system, um, except for the sample one that I created. And here we've created some tools when it's open, when it was last updated, and the status of the ticket, and if it had a reference information or reference number on it. That's all on that particular screen, and we can narrow them down by clicking on different parts at the top. The screen that we're on now is basically the top part of the ticket that we've gone into after it's been opened. We can click in at any time. Um, information that we gather here is a phone number. We can add you know, different information here. On the next screen is the bottom of the ticket. And you'll see a couple of different boxes here. One is post reply, and one is add private comment. Uh, for the purpose of this example, if we go to the next slide on the add a private con comment, we can just say that the client called and left a voicemail. Um, it's something that the, that's confidential in the, in the ticket system. Uh, on the next slide, once the comment has been posted on the screen that displays the ticket, you'll see they're all color-coded with different things. So the gray color-coded was just the question that the client had, essentially. The private uh, comment was we just tracked that someone called and left a message so they know what's happening. On the next screen, this slide shows a post reply. So you'll see that we can specify a status. It's the pink at the top. Uh, what happens with the system essentially is it's much like an email program. So whatever we type here will actually be sent by email to the client. So we can even attach a file if we wanted to, if we had a guidebook or something that we wanted to reply. Um, it basically works a lot like an email system. So uh, we can add um, canned responses to it, signatures, all different types of things. So once I post a reply, then it goes to the client as an email. So what they don't realize is that they can just simply reply to their email and it automatically adds the comments into the ticket. So it's compiling all the information in one view for us. For the client, it's seamless because they just think they're using email and replying to us in email is what they sort of see from us. So it can go back and forth different times. As it goes back and forth, the status can change. So if they reply back, it will indicate in our system that that client is now replied. So now someone that's in their center can look at it and see the new reply. So the, the statuses, which I'll get into shortly, sort of uh, allow us to narrow what's going on with a particular ticket. So for us, I mean, it's been a huge improvement on a regular email system because it groups everything together. It means that it's easy to see all of the back and forth and communications in one spot. So whether it's a lawyer making a comment or giving someone advice, or a law student making some internal notes on a file or whatever it is, it keeps it all in one place. So on the next slide, the status uh, that we're on right here, we created a whole series of different statuses. And part of it is for reporting, um, part of it is for different purposes. So this allows our staff or volunteers really to see where a ticket is at in our system. So if they're looking at the big long list of, of tickets that are open, then they'll know where each ticket is at. And this is just sort of a sample of what uh, one might select. So for example, if a staff member is calling the client for more information, we would change the status to triage. So we know that it's being handled by an office and which office is being handled by. Um, if we can't answer the client's questions in writing, 
we change the status to ready for consult. And when that happens, our volunteer lawyer will be emailed telling them that a client is ready for a phone meeting and that they, the lawyer can essentially call them from anywhere, from our office, their office, or wherever it is. Once they finish the voice call, then the lawyer would click lawyer assisted and that automatically closes the ticket and sends the client an email saying that the assistance has ended. Um, but if they have follow-up questions, all the client really needs to do is just reply and then it opens up in the ticket again and it goes through the normal chain. So it would just have a message on the, uh, on the status saying uh, there's been a new reply so that a staff member would look at it and see what's happening. But it basically goes out of the lawyer's hands once they close the ticket. So on the next slide is just some on the tools on the right hand side, there's just some basic things. Obviously there's a search engine, so if someone calls in randomly and says, I haven't heard back from you, we can put in the phone number and search for the ticket by phone number or name. We can do uh, some basic reports from here as well. Uh, we can modify any of the canned responses, different things that we built in the system. This, just to summarize a few of the things, because it's hosted on a website, obviously anyone has access to entering the ticket information. Uh, as I mentioned early on, we have one way you can open a ticket, but we have the system set up to open tickets a few other ways. So it doesn't have to be a manual person opening the ticket. Uh, what they can do is simply send us an email to a specific email address that we've set up, and then it will open the ticket from there. And another way that we have set up as well to open tickets is someone can go onto our website, fill out an application form, and that also opens a ticket. And with that, we have all of the information that we're requesting from them, um, you know, who the parties are in the matter, all the different things about their case that they're filling out in the application form, and then that's all in front of us as well when they actually um, open the ticket. So the majority of our tickets actually get by people opening application forms or requesting assistance from our website that way. Uh, as far as you clients post reply or uh, by posting a reply, it closes the ticket, sends them a message. Uh, we can keep the private comments to help manage all the communication in one place. Clients can even send an email with an attachment if they do that. So for example, if a client says they want to send us a copy of their statement of claim, they can put it in as an attachment in their email. And when they email us, it puts all of that information directly into their ticket. So anyone has access to any of the files that they sent us throughout the communications. It does some basic reports. It doesn't do a lot with the system that we're using. There's other systems out there that do more complex reporting. But as I showed you in the other screen with the status, that's why we had a whole bunch of closed reasons. So if a, if a ticket gets closed because it was beyond the purview of the center, we would but that was the reason why we closed it. So when we do reports, we can see how many tickets were closed uh, because it was beyond the purview of the center essentially. So that's what helps us with that. And it's really, it's seamless to the client. So they don't even know that we're using a ticket system. Um, everything's customized. The emails that get sent to them when a ticket gets closed can all be customized. So there's lots of, uh, lots of things that, that can go on with the system. On the next slide, this is about the consideration of whether someone, I mean basically there's two types of ticket systems. So completely off the shelf, so someone might have a system that is a monthly fee or monthly you know, charge for a ticket system. Other ones are customized, customized systems and ours is sort of somewhere in the middle. We use Joomla as the program that we have in our system that's working it and then we purchase a, an add-on software. So our cost, uh, which we're trying to keep low, is about $200 a year that we spend on maintaining the system. So it's really, really inexpensive for us. Cost was a huge consideration for us. And one of the other things is really to determine with a customized solution, it could be somewhere where you have um, a, a team, a development team that would you know, create something from scratch or have something more customized. And when we chose this one, um, I'm somewhat computer savvy, so when I programmed it, is not ex extensive programming. It's you know a lot of point and click and sort of you know running through um, the system and having some basic computer skills, but it's not complex at all. So it's something that we could implement without having to pay an IT firm to do this either. Um, and then if you're going for a system like this, you might want to decide whether it's an internal system or external. And what I mean by that is 
whether it's something you actually put out right on your website as the tickets and that people can go into and log into and check the status of their tickets. I mean, there's some really savvy people out there that would want to do that. We chose to kind of keep it hidden from them and just manage it all in the back end and where they just get emails sent to and from them. So uh, that was how we decided what we were going to do, whether we are going to put it as external. I, you've probably seen where you can go on places and open a ticket or your IT firm or whatever, and then you can go in and log in and do all of that. We just thought that was too complex for our clients to have to remember login information and all of that, um, to check the status or to, to read their comments. So uh, we just opted for that. The other thing is always is a security concern. We have uh, security certificates on our website so that it, all the information is encrypted. And then we just had to make some decisions about storage, how long we keep the information, where does it get stored, um, do we download it, or different things that we have. So those are the considerations that we made. So that's a snapshot of our ticket system. Great. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, it's really, really fascinating. I've never seen a system like this applied to in a pro bono context. Uh, it sounds like it works really, really well. Uh, so now we're going to turn uh, to our last presenter, who is Claudia Johnson, uh, the program director, I think, Claudia, from Law Help Interactive at Pro Bono Net. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about uh, Law Help Interactive and automated forms, uh, but also just a, a smattering of other really exciting things that are going on in the pro bono world. Uh, Claudia, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left or so, and then we're going to save time for questions and discussion. So with that, okay. please take it away. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we hear you great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I will try to go um, fast, but hopefully speak clearly. So just by way of background, I was a supervising attorney at the Volunteer Bar Association of San Francisco from 2000 to 2004. Um, we, I supervised all the placement of cases, the family law eviction, torts and consumer defense, including f and also federal panels. So um, we were at that point um, at the advent of the internet. Um, and we, that's how I actually met Pro Bono Net because we started using the Pro Bono Net um, advocate template to place our pro bono cases. And so from doing that experience, I became a technophile and I learned that technology can really help in a pro bono um, setting to start a case. Now we can evaluate cases with expert systems. We can place cases through technology. We can supervise our volunteers and support them. And we can close cases with technology. And we can also review and do analysis of the data uh, to improve the services, the placement, the volunteer training, et cetera. So um, just wanted to give a little background of, of how I got into technology and, and why I believe it makes a big, big, big impact. Just quickly, um, just the next slide. Um, in 2012, the ABA brought up to snuff some of the rules of competency. And so I just thank everybody that's on the call for kind of taking up on themselves to learn a little bit about, te about technology because it's now one of the things that the model rules um, encourage attorneys to do. So keep an eye on your state to see if they adopt the rules because then, you know, keeping up on benefits and uh, pros and cons of technology will be something that a pro bono project will have to do more and more. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about indirectly is this whole issue of rural versus urban and resources not being equally allocated. And the, the belief that some of us have that somebody should not be penalized or have a deficit of justice just from the accident of where they happen to live or be born or where they find themselves later in life um, as they move to more affordable areas. So we're really talking about a digital divide here. And I think that if we go to the next slide, it's really interesting that in the legal community, we're really now grappling with this digital divide and using technology to help us um, maximize how we provide services as resources are not high or as high as they need to be. So in thinking about it, you know, we've been talking about bread and butter tools, which include um, websites, develop mature sites, 
uh, from the user perspective, allowing people to search anonymously and, f and help themselves or kind of check things out before they apply to a program or go to a clinic, that kind of thing. Um, web chat, SMS, texting, all of these things are becoming um, interactive ways to talk to our clients, including uh, Skype, like has been mentioned here in Colorado, et cetera. So, you know, it's not just a website, but it's talking to or allowing the person to give you info and, and then you pull info back to them. And that's another thing that is very much being used and explore, explore, and some more experimental, other more mature, but it's like a key ingredient. The, the one that I'm going to talk about is online forms. Just wanted to mention visual, understanding graphics, understanding how the brain works. We're moving away from a legal culture of text-centric text um, information and teaching and helping people develop uh, skills to other ways of conveying information that may be more culturally appropriate uh, as the diversity in our country changes, but also more appropriate for people who may have visual disabilities as our population ages, et cetera. And um, the other thing that's kind of become a big component of, of services and pro bono and outreach is social media. So we'll skip um, these slides just in the interest of time, but my basic premise is that any pro bono project should have multiple ways of being accessed. It shouldn't be just a phone line or a drop-in or, you know, this is part of the ABA standards for legal, legal services providers. Now, I wanted to go, let's go to the heat map just to start focusing on forms. Low Help Interactive, I believe Tony mentioned it, is a national platform that is funded with LSTIC funds and other funds from private foundations, um, donations, and um, pro bono net and other partners. And basically, it allows people to create online forms anywhere where the internet is working. And the growth of Low Help Interactive um, continues. Um, this, this kind of shows you where it's very, very active. And basically, anything that is read is assemblies, states where more than 50,000 documents have been created in a year. The one that is Ochre, which is New York, that's over 100,000. I believe that last year we did something about 420,000 for the whole country. Um, this year I'm hoping we're going to get to 520 document assemblies. And so um, online forms are value, and this is LHI forms or other forms. It just depends on how the system is structured. Uh, LHI is structured specifically for the poverty law area. So in online forms, you know, you standardize the content. If there are 40, let's say that you create a divorce form with no kids, it could be that in that divorce form and no kids, there's more than one scenario that's going to come up with that fact pattern. Let's say that there's 80 scenarios to say something, even though it's a very simple one. You know, the person where the husband is in a different county or in a different state, um, they may have some property to divide or not. They don't have to deal with the custody. Say that you have 80 different case scenarios that would apply to divorce and no kids. The content, the output will be standardized for anyone that, that matches the same scenario. And so it will allow, it will create you know, complete forms for that particular case scenario within that broader interview type. And I think that that's the beauty of online forms. Um, you can do them also remotely. You can have back-end sharing if the platform allows that. We do that in LHI. In LHI, the information is reusable. So if you create an interview one for, let's say, the initial pleading, and then you need to um, put a schedule of assets together, and that's a different interview, you can take the information from that interview and recycle it to the next one without having to retype it minimizes data entry time and user error. Also because it's standardized and is basically boiling in the expert, substantive expert of, of an expert in that area of law, it requires less training for volunteer and for pro bono projects. So some states have, find, have found success with pro bono lawyers taking on cases outside of their area of expertise because through the forms they have the certainty that they're not going to miss anything and that the forms are going to produce exact package, the exact package that they need to file for that particular case use scenario. And so you could also then delegate this to a less skilled worker, a lower input cost, and still have it supervised by a lawyer, 
but you could, you know, have two lawyers with three pro bono lawyers and a secretary represent 200 people in court and help 1,400 people. And this is a real example from California where they're doing guardianships in Betzedek. Moving on to the next slide. So what it is, and some of you may have seen some of these um, in other places, and I apologize because I know that we have some LHI mavens on the call. But for those of you who have never seen LHI, basically it has an interview component, which could be for lawyers, which is the one that's in the back, or could be for, for self-represented, which is the well-known A2J author tool that collects data. And then LHI, the system itself, takes the data from either interview design, puts it in a format that then creates a document um, that is complete and has everything that was required in the interview. The person can print and share an email through LHI site with anyone that has an account or has an email. Um, in the back end of LHI, in the past four years, we have done additional um, implementations to integrate with other systems. So for example, in Riverside, the courts are now uh, fax and filing domestic violence petitions very successfully. In Minnesota and New York, they are e-filing domestic violence petitions from the self-help center at the court with pro bono lawyer volunteers helping the victims uh, do those petitions. And then in other states, they're being used through um, connections, secure connections to um, case management systems in legal aid so that you're minimizing the retyping and the lawyer can get recommended templates based on that area of law. Um, if you're interested in learning about online forms and um, kind of connecting with the LHI community, we do provide support. We have resources that you can um, reach out to us to access. So um, this year so far, we have done about 400,000 interviews um, collectively as a community, and that's about 18,000 interviews per day. About 15% of our interviews are done through pro bono lawyers and advocates. So that's very exciting to see the growth. Um, if, if you want to connect with LHI, the best way to do that is to reach out to me, and I can put my email on the chat. We have monthly calls. We have a national technical webinar. We do live trainings, one that generally coincides with the LSC TIC conference which I encourage all of you who have an interest in technology and that's proven in legal aid to attend. That's going to be in January, and I'll put the email on the chat when I'm done talking. We have, month, uh, we have an expert groups that can help you with your templates. So we will teach you how to create the forms. We will teach you how to think about the space where the forms will be applied in, kind of consultant to think from beginning to end. We, will, we have evaluations we can share. We can connect you with other people doing similar work. We have a portal where we have over 3,000 already created forms that you can look at and explore to see if those would be helpful in your specific area of law. So there's a lot going on with LHI, and just want to let you know that this is not something that you would have to figure out yourself. Pro bono net has to staff people, uh, Miranda Watkins and myself, who will kind of be here to help you move along a project because a new project is always a little more difficult than a project that has already been done. The other thing that I wanted to say is that as much as I love forms, it's not just about the forms. It's about the forms and the contextual information that goes around a form. And some of the panelists show this, you know, like having the Skype or having um, additional information. Uh, many portals have been very successful in improving and connecting people to forms for those that will not get representation. So, for example, in Georgia, uh, they have successfully grouped um, not just the forms, but the referrals, the videos, the brochures on high volume areas like foreclosure um, as a mini portal so that people getting um, foreclosure or in fear of foreclosure can go there and get like a really comprehensive understanding before they start contacting 
um, legal aid for help or as they do to support themselves or if they're rejected, they have a place to go. So I think that this idea of grouping everything under a manner by area of law, it's very powerful and has been very successful in Texas. It has been very successful in Georgia. So I encourage you to think beyond just forms or beyond just interactive forms. The other example I wanted to, to share is because if some of you are working on national areas where there's one federal law, there's nothing saying that you couldn't create a well-supported website that has all the tools similar to a project that Adam leads for us in New York um, that is a FEMA appeals website. So this came out of Sandy. People were getting in a position where they needed appeals. And rather than having each state create an appeal site, you know, you can gather a certain percentage of resources and create an infrastructure that's going to be there once the funding goes away. Because anything that's staffed with people, if your funding dries up, it'll disappear. The technology will continue as long as you maintain it and keep up with what's going on with browsers and the internet and technology and new things. But it's an issue of sustainability. As, as Claudia mentioned, I worked on this uh, FEMA appeals form and it was, I didn't have a lot of experience with Law Help Interactive before, uh, but with Claudia and Miranda's help, it was incredibly easy to do. Um, they're so responsive to questions and really great about offering support. Um, and just like Claudia says, it, uh, it really lasted far beyond uh, the immediate context where we used it. Um, afterwards, it was <clears throat> altered and used by folks in Oklahoma responding to uh, tornado, uh, serious tornado damage and more. So um, really neat resource. And Claudia, thanks so much for sharing some of those with us. And we have about sure. uh, 15 minutes left or so, and we've received a bunch of great questions. And so I'm going to go through some of them. And if our presenters are still on the line and they want to respond, that would be awesome. Uh, if Jillian or Brian, you guys want to jump in and, and uh, help out as well, that would be great. So one of the first questions uh, that we had come up was for, I think, uh, Paul and Rick and Beth. Uh, and it's about whether you uh, experience any um, pushback, resistance, uh, not just discomfort with using the technology, but people saying they don't want to use Skype or they don't feel comfortable sharing their information on the Internet. Uh, Rick Morgan here. Uh, in answer to that, I, there is occasionally some apprehension from folks who are working with the uh, software. But by way of example, uh, one of our clinics is done in southwestern Colorado. Uh, where we uh, on uh, the uh, Ute reservation, and we from time to time have folks who come into the clinic, a family of Navajo or Ute uh, Native Americans, and they simply don't do any interaction at all except talk to the computer or talk to the laptop or the person who's on the laptop. So we're, the software allows for accommodation of a very, very broad uh, spectrum of uh, computer literacy. Great, thank you, Rick. Uh, Rick, another question for you while you're here. You talked about the way that your program is expanding, uh, and Beth also mentioned how popular it's become. Somebody had inquired, when you get up to 250 volunteer lawyers, how are you planning to manage all those folks? Great question. We're hoping that we'll be able to use scheduling software to do that efficiently, but we're also looking at a structural approach where we have individual coordinators for each of the counties and then four volunteer attorneys from somewhere in Colorado or anywhere in Colorado assigned to that county that's then being coordinated by an individual uh, with, that, with those responsibilities. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, another question was around funding. Uh, a lot of the uh, tools that we've seen today uh, use uh, either free or low-cost uh, and readily available resources like Skype. Uh, but still, there's a you know there are definitely hard costs involved in terms of uh, resources and personnel uh, paying for someone to supervise the program, et cetera. Have you folks uh, received any sort of uh, particular funding, or do you have any tips for folks who are trying to get a project like this off the ground? This is Beth. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well. 
I, I know Rick has obtained some private grant funding and I obtained some bar association funding. Um, I also was very successful with just asking people to donate equipment and time. So um, a lot of the infrastructure is already in place to have pro bono attorneys. Um, and access to justice is a big program in Colorado, so the courts themselves and the judicial departments have backed us up to dedicate their own staff to um, get these programs running, so that's not necessarily funding, but all of that has come through. Uh, an obstacle that surprised me I ran into is that um, I'm a past legal services myself, but um, legal services and some of those larger agencies are in place, and if they're not in bo on board with these new programs, um, sometimes they even discourage me from applying for funding that they already had dedicated to staff, which of course they're grossly understaffed. So um, I guess that was an obstacle where um, if the technology is not on board with the legal service agencies, and that's why I appreciate a program like this that gets them on board the other way because we certainly don't want to cut into staff funding, but these programs do need to be funded through the vehicles like legal services that are already in place, and, and, and we need to work together to make that happen. Yeah, Beth, I think that's a really, really fascinating point. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, the similar things like that happen uh, back east where we look at creating uh, some sort of innovative pro bono initiative, but you know we need funding from a, a sort of finite pot of resources, and uh, money that goes to help that get off the ground uh, does not go to legal services or other uh, you know orga fantastic organizations who need it uh, just as much, if not more. It's a really, a really interesting tension. Um, let's see, some of the other questions that we had, go ahead. It looks like we, on on that note around funding, um, M. Hoffrichter noted in the chat that she, um, or she or he got their hardware from the big law firm that they partnered with to provide the volunteers. And it also looks like Claudia noted some several ideas. Um, funding ideas by areas of law in the chat from LSC TIG to the Knight Foundation Cities Challenge to ABA AT, A, A2J grants, um, several several ideas you can check out, or Claudia, if you have any notes on that as well, um, feel free to pipe up. Great. Th thank you, Jillian. Uh, another uh, question that I'll try to synthesize, we've gotten sort of a few different questions uh, of this flavor is when you are looking to employ technology in a pro bono program, how do you go about making the decision uh, to choose the, the technology that's right for you? Uh, we've heard about people using Skype, uh, people using Zoom. Uh, Tony and Citizenship Works are, are building their own uh, from their own system from scratch. Uh, Brian, uh, I believe he said he's using Joomla. So can folks speak a little bit to how they kind of evaluated the options and, and what made sense for them? Um, if no one else wants to start, I'll go ahead and start. So this is Tony. Um, as Adam mentioned and I said earlier, we're, we're custom building our own platform. And one of the things, you know, I previously actually had, we had thought about uh, other ways of going about this and one of the challenges we've always faced is that um, trying to provide support particularly to a national network of, of partners um, and potentially sort of providing support to, uh, to users of our site which is going to be a national site accessible to anyone on the web drove us to really think about the user experience and the user interface of the tools that we were going to deploy um, and the, the simpler we could make it, the better. And so I think that's just one factor that really drove um, our decisions in thinking about how to, uh, thinking about building our own platform. And if we were to use a third party um, service or a third party um, tool like Skype or, uh, or something similar, I think we would, um, if we were stuck in that situation, I think we would, that's, that, that would definitely absolutely be the, the driving factor for us. 
Yeah, Rick Morgan here. If I might just follow up on Tony's comment, just a very quick note. As folks are reviewing different software possibilities, I really recommend that you contact the engineering shop that is associated with those with those packages. And if you're able to convince the engineering shop, the people who are writing the software and distributing the updates, uh, if you if you can get them to share your vision. Uh, we've been very successful in working with the Zoom software and getting them to build in the things that we want. So uh, checking with the engineering shop is actually doing that. And that's not always easy to do, but if you can, uh, it can be very helpful in making a decision. Great. Those are, those are both really good points. Um, I, I think that uh, also something uh, to follow up on Rick's comment that uh, I've definitely seen happen is Despite the fact that uh, in creating pro bono programs or working in legal services, uh, we don't always have really deep pockets, uh, we do have a lot to offer companies, you know, in terms of opportunities to help people. And I think they value that a lot and are often willing to donate services or sort of go beyond their usual offerings to uh, to make things work for us. Are there any, Brian or Jillian, did you see any other questions that we want to be sure to address before we jump off? Nope, that sounds good. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, all of our presenters today. It was a really fantastic program. I know that I learned a lot, uh, and it's given me a lot to think about uh, when I go back to uh, working on, you know, trying to put things like this together. If you want to follow up with our presenters or myself, uh, you're more than welcome. And Brian has put in the chat box uh, where you can get the slides, uh, definitely please take the survey and give us some feedback on how you think we did today. Uh, we hope that uh, this was helpful and fun for you. And uh, that's it, Brian. I'll turn it over to you in case you want to give any other sign off. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for putting this on. I greatly appreciate it. I uh, just want to let people know that we also have a new homepage on the LSM tap uh, website. It's got all of the videos on there in a playlist from this last year. And then all of our previous videos are on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have two more trainings coming up this year, one of them on social media and one of them on data dashboards. And then we'll be closing out for this year. Uh, we are definitely gonna be continuing these uh, next year. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Look forward to reading your feedback and using that feedback for next year.